Welcome friends. Uh, since we started making pop, a lot of people have been asking for a root beer. And I'm about eight variations in at this point. And I think I've got something that works pretty well. So I'm gonna show that one to you today. In this pot, I put one liter of water and uh, some ginger that I have chopped up fairly fine. Now you could grate the ginger if you wanted to, just to extract a little bit more flavor. And I'm going to put in one cinnamon stick. And yes, I know, this isn't true cinnamon, this is cassia. Um, if you can get true cinnamon, use it, but I think the cassia actually brings the punch to this that we're looking for. So I put this in a pot and I'm going to bring this up to a boil and I'm gonna boil it for two to three minutes to extract as much flavor as I can from those two ingredients. Now we're gonna talk about the roots, since this is root beer. Now this is sassafras and sassafras is the major main flavor component in root beer. And I saw a lot of root beer recipes out there on the internet um, and in books where this was the only ingredient beyond sugar and water, um, relied extremely heavily on this one flavor. And I thought it made a pretty good tasting beverage, but I wanted a little bit more complexity. So I started looking at other recipes that added other roots. Um, and the next most popular root is sarsaparilla. Um, and if you watched a lot of old westerns, you would know that the cowboy would go in and he would ask for a sarsaparilla. And that is uh, a variation on root beer that is only made with the sarsaparilla root. Um, and I like the flavor of both of these. Next flavor component that I'm going to use is licorice root. Um, you know what licorice tastes like, that sort of anise seed, dark, uh, sweet flavor. And then I'm gonna put in some wild cherry bark. Now, other components that I saw in a lot of recipes and I tried and I didn't like was um, birch bark. A lot of people put in burdock root or dandelion root or all three of those. And I thought they brought kind of uh, an extra bitterness that I didn't want in my root beer. So that's the combination of roots that I landed on. And I would suggest that if you're going to make root beer, go out and look at all of the recipes um, and take each of the individual roots and make a cup of hot tea with it. Um, put in a little bit of sugar and taste it just so that you can get an idea of what that individual root tastes like and what it's going to bring to the eventual end product. I think that's very important to sort of understand what all of the components are. And I'm also giving you this by weight. Um, I came across a lot of recipes that said to use a tablespoon of this and a tablespoon of that. And that's great, but not all of these roots are ground to the same way or chopped the same way. And so you would get a big variation in the amount of flavor that you're going to get in the end result, which isn't good either. Weight is always going to give you the same amount of flavor. So this has come to a boil. It's boiled for a couple of minutes. I'm gonna turn it off. I'm going to take it off of the heat and I'm going to add these in. I'm gonna give it a stir and then put the lid back on. And I'm gonna let that steep for 15 to 20 minutes just to extract the flavors. Now this is where I diverge from a lot of the recipes that I found. Um, I tried it by putting all of the roots in and boiling it like I was told for 10, 15, 20 minutes and then letting it steep for two or three hours. And I found that it extracted um, an astringency, uh, an almost a bitterness, a lot of tannins that caused an unpleasant feeling in my mouth that I just didn't like, a flavor that I didn't like. It wasn't bright and it wasn't cheerful like a root beer should be. And I found that if I never boil the roots, if I boil the water and then add the roots and only let it steep for 15 to 20 minutes, you're going to get really nice, bright flavors without sort of the tannic astringency. So we're gonna let this go 15, 20 minutes and then we're going to strain it out. Okay, smells amazing. Now we need to filter out the solids. And this is a very important step. Um, if the solids stay in too long, they will continue to release their astringency. And over time, it'll start to taste really dull. So we need to strain them out and we're gonna use a fine mesh strainer to get the big bits out. Look at that color. Great. Now that we've got the big bits out, we're going to strain it through a coffee filter. Now I have used paper coffee filters, 
I've used double thickness paper coffee filters. I've used double thickness paper coffee filters with this micro mesh filter. And I found that the micro mesh filter on its own gets just as much as the paper filters or any combination thereof. So we're going to pass it through the coffee filter. Great, now I'm gonna put a lid on this and I'm going to chill this as quickly as possible in a cold water bath. I'm going to bring the temperature down fast and that's gonna help whatever is left in here to precipitate out. Um, it's almost as effective as a filter and in some ways it's our second or third method of filtration. And as soon as that's done, we'll move on. Okay, now that it's chilled down, we need to sweeten it and we're going to use two different types of sugar, but first, we're going to very carefully pour the chilled liquid into this pot. And you don't want to swirl it. You want to pour very carefully because at the bottom, there's going to be quite a bit of sediment left and we don't want to transfer that to the pot. Okay, what's left in there is sediment and that will just make the drink bitter. We don't want that. Now, next in is the sugar. We're using two kinds of sugar, and I found that sugar for pop making seems to be very vexing to a lot of people. Um, the first thing I'm gonna put in is brown sugar. And we've got this on a medium high heat, and we just wanna bring this up to a low simmer so that we can dissolve the sugar into the liquid. Um, we don't wanna bring it to a boil, again, because that could introduce bitterness. Just a low, low simmer. And I'm using brown sugar. A lot of the recipes that I found use brown sugar or molasses or a combination of brown and white sugar or just white sugar or white sugar and molasses. It was all over the map. And I think it comes down to the flavor profile that you're looking for. I'm looking for that little bit of caramely flavor that comes from the brown sugar. So I'm using all brown sugar as the sweetener. Um, if you wanna use another sweetener, a non-sugar sweetener like stevia, I'm sure that'll work. I don't know what the proportion would be. This is something that you can play with and make it as sweet or not sweet as you want. Um, but know this, if you're going to do this as a naturally carbonated root beer, which is part of the process that we're going to move on to, uh, stevia won't work. Uh, the yeast needs sugar. So as this comes up the temperature, I'm gonna put in lactose. And obviously if you're lactose intolerant, you're not gonna put lactose in. I'm gonna put lactose in for a bunch of different reasons. Um, I use it in actual beer brewing down in the brewery. And as much as it's a sweetener, it's not gonna bring a whole lot of sweetness to this drink. And so the lactose is going to do a few things for us. Uh, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to give that nice, white, creamy, frothy, foamy head that we all associate with root beer as it spills over the top of the glass in all of the advertising. The second thing it's going to do, it's going to create a nice unctuous mouthfeel, a really luxurious kind of stays in your mouth mouthfeel um, that we all associate with root beer. And as much as I said that it's not going to add a lot of sweetness, if you end up doing a natural ferment or naturally carbonated version with the, with the yeast, yeast don't eat, or the yeast that we're using anyway, the yeast that we're using won't eat the lactose or milk sugar, which will in the end help to preserve some of the sweetness. Okay, I think everything is dissolved and we can pour this into this glass container. And I'm just gonna let this cool before we move on to the next step. Now, there's one last ingredient and that is vanilla extract. Now, I'm gonna put in about a tablespoon. Um, I found that anywhere between a tablespoon and a tablespoon and a half gets you where you wanna be. And a lot of people are gonna ask if you could use a vanilla bean. And I've tried it with vanilla beans. I've tried it with double vanilla beans. Um, I found that by the time I steeped the vanilla bean to get the flavor I wanted, I pulled out too much astringency from the roots. And so the best way to get that vanilla flavor is with the extract that I found. Um, and you, you know, give it a try. If you wanna try it at home, please do. So that's all mixed together. Now we're gonna diverge. Um, this is your root beer syrup. 
and you mix one part of this with three parts of carbonated water and you get a root beer pop just like you would at the corner store. I'm also going to do a version where we ferment it with our ginger bug, our wild ginger bug. So in here I'm going to put about 500 mils just like that and the rest is going to go into this jug. Okay, now for the naturally fermented or naturally carbonated ginger beer, I'm going to use about a third of a cup of my ginger bug. And my ginger bug is, uh, is pretty active, it's in good shape, and I think that should be enough to get us where we're going. So I'm going to put that in. And I know from previous tests that this yeast um, is only going to give me somewhere between 1.5 and 2% alcohol by volume when it... Uh, when it ferments out. I'm just going to put in a little bit more. I think um, a little bit of the yeast settled in the bottom and so I want to put some more in. Okay, stir that in. Now I've got uh, flip top beer bottles. These are really strong actual beer bottles that will take the pressure. They're cleaned and sanitized. Yes, of course I've sanitized my bottles. And we just stir in the ginger bug to make sure that it's evenly distributed. And then we just pour it into the bottles. Now, uh, when you pour it in, you want to leave enough headspace for the expansion of gas while these ferment. So I just bring it up just a little bit past the shoulder, and that should be fine. Close it up and move along. Okay, so last one. Seal it up. I'll leave these on the counter for two, maybe three days to allow them to ferment and carbonate, and then I'll stick them in the fridge. Um, and I'll see you in a few days, and we're going to do a tasting of both versions. Okay. Ooh. So there is carbonation. So this is root beer two ways. This is the syrup that I've mixed with carbonated water. And this is the one that we put the ginger bug in. Is it carbonated? Mm, not so carbonated. Light carbonation. So I should have left it out on the uh, counter longer. Oh, but when you give it a moment. Yeah. It is. It is carbonated. So that was three days on the counter before I put it in the fridge. Maybe four days would have been better. Who knows? Let's taste it. Color's different. Yes. Okay, so I'll try this one first. I guess I'll try this one first. It's a very pleasant flavor. I think that one's more root beery. Completely different, aren't they? That, that one's more, a sweeter. If I was saying root beer, I would say that one. This one, though, is a very pleasant flavor. It's just yes. not root beer. I think the, so it seemed to me, mm -hmm. the fermentation with the ginger bug okay. has taken some of the top flavors off. The ones that you, that yeah, are, that initial, that initial, oh, this is root beer that I'm drinking. Oh, that's that's a lovely root beer. That's full on root beer, isn't it? This is this is something that you would. But that's quite. It, they're both. It's very refreshing and pleasant. I mean, some more bubbles would be nice. They're they're both great in their own way. So a, a day or two more on the counter in order to ferment that to to bring up the level. Go ahead. I was going to say we did a bunch of. Diff did we do multiple different days in this? No, I just put it out for three days and said three days should be fine. Okay. <laughs> so I'm right, probably, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the rest of the bottles out of the fridge. Heat them up again. And, and the... just let them come to room temperature, go for a couple more days, and then put them back in the fridge, which is something you can do to test your fermentation as you go along anyway. Um, so this is a very basic root beer recipe. And there's so much more that you can add to it. As you as you look at the labels of other root beers. There's so many other things that people put in it, other than just the roots. So there's anise seed, or oh, I yes. mean, like they'll put in a whole bunch of other things. 
And we put licorice root in here, so the anise seed would bring that licorice flavor up. Yes, it would. Sort of enhance that. But I think that is sort of the classic root beer flavor that most people... Mm -hmm. Now we need to test it against other root, beer? other root beers. So I've got a half dozen other root beers, and we're going to do, uh, do we're going to do a taste off between all of them. So come on back and uh, and see that video and give this recipe a try. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.